Pond Scum to People Evolution, as I've said before, is pure imagination. It's science to say that dogs produce dogs, but it's not science to say that dogs, pine trees, bacteria, and whales are related. There's a lot of imagining going on. Evolutionists imagine that mutations make something new and better. Evolutionists imagine that all these small scale variations will eventually add up to make something we don't actually observe. Time, as I've said before, is the hero of the story for the evolutionist. Evolutionists and SpongeBob should start a private school together. This is the perfect way for evolutionists and like-minded individuals to teach each other that dinosaurs and carrots are related through common ancestry. Stay tuned for a thorough tour of SpongeBob University. But Welcome to SpongeBob University. Evolutionists hope, they dream, they imagine. Only the most imaginative of evolutionists are accepted. Requirements for those that believe they have the wild imaginations necessary for enrollment at SpongeBob University, just a few of them. You must believe that natural selection and mutations can explain all new innovations, structures, body plans, and novel information, which we actually know cannot actually be the result of natural selection acting upon random variation and random mutations. Evolutionists imagine these things, even though empirical evidence tells us that neo-Darwinism lacks incredible explanatory power in regards to the origin of phenotypic complexity, anatomical novelty, and the origin of non-gradual modes of transition, abrupt fossil appearance, for example. Students of SpongeBob University must also imagine that they share ancestry with apes. Grandpa, is that you? Even though all empirical evidence suggests otherwise. I, what? I wish I could see Aaron's eyes right now. I bet they're just bulging out. <laughs> <laughs> like that cartoon. Yeah. You, yeah. The pond, what the, was the that argument? The ponds come to people. Dude, even lost me on yeah, that yeah. one. I don't know. <laughs> All right, everyone. Let's kick this off. This is Aaron Raw debunking our video, debunking his phylogeny challenge. Let's get this started. In this first one, because I know it's three hours worth of mindless stupidity. Wow, he must have gone through every little bit of that video, piece by piece, to complain about it being three hours. Let's see if that's true, shall we? Devise. Because they're eye type. Have you heard, so have you heard anything to do with this, Arn? Hadn't been thought of. No. Okay. Never heard of it. Uh, it's the first three seconds of the video. EAX6 is one of those pesky instances for evolution. I, I clicked on like two or three spaces in it, and I only watched it a few seconds at a time. Oh, okay. There we have it. That's the truth. He only watched a few seconds here and there on a video that he came on to debunk. Brilliant. Have you heard, so have you heard anything to do with this, Arn? Been... No. Pac-6 is a master control gene, so I don't, I don't see... I mean, he's getting the... I, I think he's getting the science correct, I guess, but I don't think his conclusions follow. I don't think I've ever heard of Standing for Truth. Raw Matt sounds familiar. Oh, Standing uh, for Truth. I feel like I might even have he's, talked to him once. Stand, on standing for Truth. Yeah, I would hope you'd remember me. We had multiple conversations. None. But let me guess, maybe the most popular? Well, that's argument of authority. And if we're going to use that argument, then atheists are toast as well, because your pathetic 5% of the world's population trying to say that the burden of proof is on the 95% is just oh. stupid. The masses don't oh. need to convince the minority of anything. That was a also, slap right there. Call evolution or species? It, was a, it, it was a tradition that is now being discarded that you would separate humans from apes and uh, apes from monkeys, saying you know that... that and and this was this is one of the problem with a, a number of traditional scientists still haven't understood. So Aaron just said that traditional scientists, even those today, just don't understand. That's what he's trying to tell you. He knows better. But yet when we try to correct science, oh no, we can't do that. See the problem? See the double standard? So when a creationist says that man and apes are not related, we're lying. But when a scientist says that they're not related, they're just mistaken or confused. Got it. When they say things like evolution only deals in biology, then they go on and use geology, paleontology, earth scientists, and more to strengthen their argument for evolution and to help them build their phylogenetic trees, saying to others, see how all fields of science help prove evolution? It's called consilence. But yet Hold they on. get very upset when a creationist does the same thing. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> 
No, 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 I'm not upset that evolutionists use paleontology and geology. I'm upset that during arguments and debates, I'm not allowed to use them. Everyone always says evolution only has to do with biology. If you, They didn't even understand what I was trying to say. They didn't listen. They didn't even start at the beginning. That was the problem. When they started looking recently, they found that turtles uh, uh, have no shells when they spend their life in the ocean. The longer they spend their time what, in the what? ocean, the less they need what? a shell. Since I don't think R and Raw either believed me or didn't understand what I was saying, I guess I'll post it here. This is the National Geographic website, who also stated that once turtles hit the water, their shell size reduces. The leatherback turtles themselves don't even have hard shells. It's not. There are two different cl uh, cladistics uh, uh, definitions for turtle. They're still debating. No, the there are not. not there is not two different. Saying. Uh, yeah, there are two different cladistic classifications for turtles, Arn. I don't know why I'm teaching you this. This is your specialty, for God's sake. Which major taxonomic group, or clade, of reptiles that turtles belong to? Now, most of reptiles fall under the clade known as Eureptilia, or true reptiles. This includes stuff like lizards, snakes, dinosaurs, and birds. But there's also Parareptilia, or side reptiles. These are some of the earliest reptiles, all of which are now extinct, like the spiky cheeked Procolophonids and the Mesosaurs, which were probably the first aquatic reptiles. Now, by and large, which clade you put turtles in depends on where you think its shell came from. Turtles' exact place among the U reptiles isn't settled either. A lot of researchers think they're more closely related to the clade that includes animals like crocodiles and birds, but others argue that they're closer to a different group that includes lizards and snakes. Hopefully it won't take another 130 years for an answer to that debate. A bacteria yeah. can never produce a non-bacteria. It never happens. We didn't evolve from bacteria. We're not bacteria. Okay, one more time. A bacteria yeah. can never produce a non-bacteria. It never happens. We didn't evolve from bacteria. We're not bacteria. You hypocrite. You teach frogs came from an amoeba. <laughs> You think they could get it in 10 million years? Get a horse with wings? Why not? <laughs> I mean, that the phylogeny challenge cannot be debunked, then that makes it not a challenge, right? That's, Why? It's nothing to be debunked. Well, I know of, I know of the, the earliest fossil bats are neither giant nor burrowing. Listen to this. And pugs and chihuahuas are still dogs. They have never started becoming a whale like evolution claims can happen. And evolution does not claim that. Ever. Where in the okay, world, Matt, would you think evolution claims anywhere that a whale whale did, yeah, Acadia, could, 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 could evolve oh, from because whales from, from supposedly canine. evolved from a land mammal. The tale of whale evolution is a story about one of the most remarkable transitions in the history of mammals. The fossil record shows how these animals transform from tiny four-legged plant eaters no bigger than house cats to the seafaring giants we know today. This change was dramatic and kind of fast. Evolution does not say a anything. A individual anything turns into a individual anything right. either. So Paleontologists in Kashmir, India, found the fossils of a 47 million year old hoofed creature the size of a house cat that they named Indohyus. Evolution does not say a anything. A individual anything turns into a individual anything right. either. Actually, it specifically says that. Back in a SpongeBob La La Land. That's what the phylogeny challenge is. It's getting them to identify what the fuck is a created kind. Okay. So honeybee All and flower figures. are a created kind. How is honeybee and flower a single created kind? That doesn't even make any sense. How is because a plant to, and an animal the same organism. kind? What? Oh, oh no. wait, because they're a symbiotic species. The flower needs a plant and a plant needs a honeybee, for example. Oh, they they true. try to say that Except beetles that and wind did it. But. Except that they don't. And we know that earlier plants used wind for pollinization. Then and how earlier Japan insects. Does. Well, that's a presumption because Japan has now lost It's their not a presumption Japan, because it's. I tried telling him twice and I couldn't. So I guess I'm going to have to say it now. Aaron, 
Japan has lost its bees a while ago now, and since then they have had to now pollinate by hand. Do you know why? Because wind cannot do it. And that's what evolution has told us. Matter of fact, that's what you even said to me. But the matter of fact, they have been working on a solution for a while now and have invented tiny little drones to replace bees. So the intensive manual labor required from the burden of can be lifted from the people that have to do it by hand. If wind or insects and beetles were sufficient, then they would not have to go to such lengths. Besides, even Einstein himself said, if bees disappeared off the face of the earth, man would only have four years left to live. But it's okay. I'm sure you know far better than him. What did he ever know about anything, right? But let me get this straight. All life today that requires flowering, pollinating plants and the fruit that they bear could not survive without pollinating plants and what they bear. Therefore, bees are absolutely required. Without bees, there is no pollination. And this is a fact. And now we know it's a fact because of the devastation that is happening in China and Japan because of the dwindling bee population. Right? Primates, for example. Yet we are told bees just arose millions of years ago, and the planet has just been so stable for all those millions of years that until now we have a slight variation in temperature, and now all the bees are dying because of it. Like that makes any sense at all. Such a weak, volatile little honeybee, yet survived millions of years on fluctuating Earth's temperatures and climate change, including multiple bottlenecks and cataclysms and supposedly survived it all. But yet, here we have the bee today, and now we're getting a little temperature spike, and they're dying, and they're dying off rampantly. Here's a bee in the fossil record dated at 80 million years. Here it is in the New York Times Magazine. Look at it, complete stasis, hasn't evolved at all. What is your rescuing device from this? Supposedly, there's been multiple bottlenecks since that time, but yet the bee survived that? I don't think so. You show me proof that anything was ever created, or that anything even could be created like your religion says. Uh, okay. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? The theory of evolution would state that the egg came first too. You see, since DNA can only be modified before birth, this would mean a mutation must have taken place at conception. So some kind of animal similar to a chicken would have laid an egg and a mutated version of that animal would have hatched, which would have been a chicken. This new chicken would then go on and breed and spread its mutation and more chickens would appear as generations go on. So a lot of the evidence would point that the egg would have come first, but these are all just theories. The true answer to this question lies in protein. British researchers discovered something very interesting when looking at eggshells. They noticed that the protein necessary to create eggshells are only found in the ovaries of a chicken. This means the chicken must have come first. The protein is called ovocleridin 17 and it controls the eggshell's crystallization process. Without this protein, the shell just couldn't form at all. Next, we have creation of the universe, which obviously there was a beginning, contrary to the many other theories where they tell you that the universe has always existed. <laughs> okay things all the time this is genetic breakdown this is degradation genomic sorry steve you're behind the times on this one these are not beneficial mutations whatsoever these are all epigenetic regulations here i'll explain it for you when you hear about people saying there's such thing as beneficial mutations and we need them and that's how we evolved and they bring up the lactose mutation and the increase in bone density and the hiv1 immunity and then the l milano these these are all epigenetic regulations these are not mutations and so now that we've been unraveling the sequences of epigenetics for the last six years really really well they've actually completely eradicated the beneficial mutation theory. So basically what I want to do is get into the, the problems that people are having um, with the concept. And that would be, I guess, kind of explaining epigenetics. So basically epigenetic inheritance 
is this uh, new unconventional way of looking at genetics. Up until now, a mutation was considered the only thing that could be either positive or negative in regards to fitness, because without mutations, evolution can occur. So this is where epigenetic comes from, and it throws it goes against basically the idea that uh, inheritance only happens through genetic mutations or the DNA code passes on to the parent from offspring. This means that a parent's experiences in the form of epigenetic tags can be passed down to future generations. So circadian rhythm, diet, stress, environment, all of these switches, for example, like rats. Um, they took rats and they put them in an aquarium and they switched the lights on for three hours and off for three hours and they kept doing this for years and eventually those rats adapted to this light cycle so when they had offspring their those children now would fall asleep every three hours and fall and every three hours just like the parents were doing even if the lights were not being turned on or off for every three hours sometimes it was inherited other times it was not and then after a couple generations of lights being back to 24 hours, the rats just essentially gave up on that and they went back to being a 24 hour cycle. So it wasn't a permanent thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a mutation that caused this. So epigenetics is the study of where factors influence a gene and how and when the gene is expressed regarding like the Sherpas of the high altitude people of the Nepal. Uh, the mainstream thought is that a single one point mutation led to a better adaptation for the high altitudes of the Tibetan people. But modern science has revealed that the epigenetic mechanisms are also behind this adaptation. It's not a beneficial mutation. You can read a peer-reviewed uh, peer paper on this, um, on the epigenetic signatures of the high altitude adaptation of the Tibetan population. So basically, these epigenetic regulators affect how individuals develop. Uh, this is uh, pretty much which are causes of changes in the expression of the genes or action of a gene or any gene. For example. Um, uh, we have longevity genes in this, for example. They're called the FOXO genes and they're seven sirtuin genes. And these are mediated by epigenetics. They're not mutations. We could, they're turned on and off. Like uh, for fasting, for example, uh, turns off a uh, mTOR and it activates these longevity genes. We want that to happen. And until we can go in and mutate these genes and constantly leave them on, we have to rely on epigenetics to do that. And we are in control of these genes by what we do. So sorry, Steve, you've lost on this one. We have genetic deterioration going on all around us and no beneficial mutations occurring anywhere. And that's a fact. I would like to say that we we have a way to determine whether or not our model, we can do this. We can go, what are the odds that all human beings are related by 99.9%? .9 what are the odds, are the that, odds? All, uh, that human okay, beings have to no, no, We're not going to do this because I understand how that... Exactly. So to actually help them understand some of our models, some of our predictions, some of our thoughts on why we actually believe that the Bible to be true over other religions, I was going to play what are the odds game. I could not get out one answer without being cut off. So now I will finish that for you. What are the odds that all humans are 99.9% .9 all related? Just like the Bible says. And all from the Fertile Crescent, exactly like the Bible says. We have been genetically deteriorating since the fall of Adam because sin brought death into the world and rapid disease increase is evident, just like the Bible describes. And we can show with empirical evidence that there is both a fast mtDNA clock and a huge increase in diseases every single year. What are the odds that we're all frugivores, just like Genesis 1 says that God placed man into a garden and gave him every fruit-bearing tree to eat from? What are the odds that all obligate carnivores can love off of plants, just like the Bible says? What are the odds that the best genetics are tracked to the Middle East, just like the Bible says where man came from? What are the odds that all languages arose around the same time, just like the Bible describes? How about when the scientists found which came first, the chicken or the egg? Today, we know it's the chicken, just like the Bible says. Again, what are the odds that most religious texts worldwide tell us that man has lived to extreme ages during what is known as the Golden Age? And now we know that language cannot arise on its own, because just like the Bible tells us, God taught Adam. So let alone all these facts, quantum physics has indirectly proven God by proving that the argument against the philosophy called materialism has been now falsified. It's dead. 
Again, so what are the odds that all humans came from a single female? I don't think people consider this fact very much. Let's just take a look at that last comment that I made about all humans being from a single female. What are the odds of this? If a secular evolutionist even considered this for just a moment, rather than shrugging it off with excuses like there must have been a bottleneck, or there were probably many other women alive and those women didn't have kids, or maybe all of them just had boys, completely non-logical, especially when I describe the scenario for you in a minute. Besides, even according to their own theory, they have no proof of any bottleneck occurring, not in paleontology, the fossil record, or geology in the geological column. So, what evidence do we have for this belief of a bottleneck? They don't have anything for it. That's your answer. A failed hypothesis is all that they have. You see, this is the real problem. According to the evolution theory, about 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, there were about 10,000 to 30,000 individuals. That's an estimate. Now, let's just say half were women. That leaves us with 5,000 or 15,000, whatever you want to go with. Let's just say that the average is 10,000 for this debate. So now we have 10,000 different lines of possible mitochondrial DNA to be passed down. Yet we only have one today. What are the odds of this? That's highly improbable. But if you start with a biblical account, this lines up perfectly as to what we would expect and what we do see. There should be just one line, and there is just one line, exactly what the empirical evidence shows. Vast correlations line up directly with what the Bible says, and this is undeniable evidence. Well, you know what's interesting? When the Human Genome Project mapped the human genome, they said there's only one race of people. You know what that confirms? The Bible. Because we all go back to Adam and Eve, we're all one race. Uh, so I don't think it confirms the Bible. It just makes the Bible consistent with nature on this one point. I'm just going to end the game here, because you get the gist of it. But the list is actually very long, and the odds of even a few of these are astronomically high. So imagine 20 of them. It becomes a statistical improbability. We, we, the whole cool up thing we're talking about is a gene that in other species produces vitamin C. We no longer have a functional yeah. version of the Gula Suda gene. It's, um, it's, it's broken in several places, mm -hmm. and I think it's missing the promoter region. So it can't be transcribed. So we actually have to get vitamin C from alternative sources. So scientists are finding that numerous of these so-called genomic fossils are actually not pseudo after all, and these genes are necessary and required to sustain healthy life processes um, in the cell. So the broken remnants of an ancient um, chicken gene, the egg yolk gene, um, you know, no such remnant exists, and instead the fragment appears to actually be a functional um, DNA element. You can look at the beta globin uh, pseudogene, some of the whale pseudogenes, the gulo pseudogene. The gulo pseudogene might actually be a broken gene, but at the end of the day, you know, I know people who have had a Chevy Cruze and, and a Honda Civic, and the air conditioner broke in the exact same way in both cars. Wow, that proves that they both evolved from a sp skateboard billions of years ago. I mean, that's how silly they are. And science enthusiasts, I got a debate with him on my channel. Go watch it it was fun question no i do i'm just curious uh, you are correct the pseudo genes that they thought were useless genes have all been found to have a function but if you put a seven-year-old under the hood of your car and say take out anything this car does not need he would probably take out a bunch of stuff because he doesn't understand the purpose of it i think the fact that the uh, you know pseudo genes and irvs have all been discovered a use for them is an example of the fact that scientists did not know the usefulness of the of the some of these parts Life is incredibly complex. The human cell or any animal or plant cell is mind boggling in its complexity. And I think someone with a lack of cell biology knowledge would say, oh, what? the cell doesn't need that, take that out. Oh, we don't need that. We don't know what that does, take it out. It's an example of ignorance on our part, not example of ignorance on the creator's part. The, the cell is mind boggling in its complexity. It had to have, there are no pseudo genes. There might be stuff that is available as a replication, I, I carry a spare tire in my car. Why? Well, one of the other tires might go flat. That's why. There may be things in the gene code that if part of the gene is damaged from radiation from the sun during the solar sunspot cycle or something, the body can quickly recover and rebuild it and fix it. So that, And why would a body develop uh, something beyond what it's using? Why would it, why would it, if it happened by evolution, why would you get a spare tire? And the guy you're talking about tonight, I saw a minute of his video where he said that uh, that humans were 
absolutely different from every other animal in every possible way? Well, no, we're not completely different. We're exactly the same in every possible way. You might want to warn your wife. Really? I have yet to see any other animal, especially primate even, ever speak language. Basic communication skills like nouns, sure, but no linguist would ever say that a fish or an ape have a language. As I am looking at my window now, people are driving by in cars. I am yet to see any monkey behind the wheel. Have you? Mmm, strange. What about food? We make food. We process food. I am yet to see any animal making food. How about you? How about music? Any animals creating any instruments to play? Not that I've ever seen. What a surprise. But that's just the obvious observation from looking around. Even biologically, we are not the same at all either. And this is what I was trying to tell Aaron last night. However, he was not listening. Ask yourself, why do they still present evidence as though it's somehow logical that we have lost everything that was good for us, like the different kinds of muscle strength that primates have? They are twice as strong as we are, easily. The video that you're watching right now is going to prove that. They also have a very powerful jaw. They can rip into a coconut within seconds. They are completely immune to infection. They have dense, thick fur protecting them from the elements. We lost all of ours, so now we have to do what? Wear clothing and sleep under more fur? That makes no sense. We sunburn. They do not. We get cancer. They do not. They have far better DNA methylation. They have far better vision and can see better colors for picking all kinds of fruits and flowers and fauna and vegetables. The Tamiran monkey alone eats more than 833 different plants from 167 different floral species and never need glasses for failing eyesight. We cannot even walk without shoes because of our fragile feet and risk of infection or parasites. They have a very thick meninges which is the layer around the brain protecting it. We humans have a very thin layer in comparison. They have far more nerve fibers than we do. They have no such thing as outdoor allergies in any primate species, yet humans have them all the time. They have far better hearing as they have three bones in their inner ear uh, that are housed within the skull outgrowth. They have far better bone density. They can fall down and nothing will break in their bodies unless it's from very high. They have two separate bones in their forearm and lower leg, giving them far more mobility than us. Humans have a greater susceptibility than other primates to most infectious disease. AIDS, malaria, and cancer kill millions of humans each year around the world. As where that's most non-human primates appear to be naturally protected against all of these diseases. If we were part of the primate species, we have failed. They have outdoor allergies. They never fail and they have they, far yeah, better they hearing. They have far better yeah, they color do. vision. They do they have, have those things. No, Arn, you're wrong. We use about 2 to 9% of our digestive ability in the colon, as where apes use about 30 to 60%. No matter how much sun they get, they can never get skin cancer. We humans get skin cancer very easily. That's right, everyone. We've lost every single beneficial physiological characteristics. How am I supposed to envision, even with pure imagination, that all of these beneficial traits just micro-evolved away into oblivion. That's not logical in the least when you break it down. As for the so-called just 1% different between apes and people, that's a perfect example of skewing the data. Get a female ape, have her hair styled, worked on her, put her in some long skinny dress, force her to wear some heels and walk, add some makeup and perfume, and then bring her to the prom. See how many guys are going to ask her to dance or try to get that ape girl on a blind date. Tell the prospective guy that you were, you can't say too much about her, but she's only 1% different from the rest of the hot chicks he knows. Watch his reaction when he sees her. Evolution teaches you to drop common sense on the floor as soon as they give you another science fact. I don't have enough faith to believe that every single physiological benefit has microevolved out of into oblivion for no reason at all. So evolution isn't guided, yet it's predictable. But then if all evolution, therefore, everything is predictable, yet falsifiable. They don't even realize they aren't being logical. So again, the evolutionist would first have to deny their own double standard theory of evolution, which states that evolution is a totally unguided process where mutations are random and things just need to survive. And yet at the same time, it also means survival of the fittest, where only the strong survive and the strong genes breed out the weak, totally contradicting each other. It's shocking they don't see it. 
look, this whole business about genetics can be easily solved and refuted with logic. The fuss over one or even 50% is not the issue. The matter comes down to this. Would you let your daughter or sister have sex with an ape? Now, come on, be honest. You are probably grossed out by that, even a little, right? There lies your answer. There's something a whole order magnitude different between a human and an ape. We're not the same and not even remotely similar. Stop being crazy and stop listening to the so-called experts who want you to drop common sense and I want you to be logical. Case closed. Is there any proof that God designed man to be this way? Oh yes, anatomical observation and comparative anatomy studies prove this as well. Omnivores, for example, can consume both meat and vegetables raw very easily, where both are harmful and hard to digest for humans in their natural form. Both require some form of processing or cooking. All omnivores have sharp fangs and bladed, shaped crushing molars. Omnivores swallow their food after a short, simple crushing. Omnivores have low jaws, which are always embedded inside of the top. Omnivores have no lateral or forward jaw mobility. Omnivore's saliva is acidic, with no pitolin. Omnivores renal secretion of uricase. Omnivores secrete acid urine. Omnivores all have strong hydrochloric acid in their stomachs. Omnivores require no fiber for peristalsis. Omnivores' facial muscles are very minimal and allow a wide mouth for a gap for food. Omnivores are able to maximize and metabolize large amounts of vitamin A and cholesterol without a problem. Humans have major problems with both. Omnivores are fueled by fat and protein. Humans are carbohydrate-based. Omnivores' intestines are always three times the length of their body. Omnivores all have short colons with smooth and alkaline by nature. Omnivores' jaws are angled and not expanded. Complete digestion is within six to ten hours. Omnivores' examples are hogs, brown bears, raccoons, primates. Omnivores are everything eaters who thrive on all raw foods from leaves and trees and stems to ground roots natural surroundings, ants, and even each other if needs be. A frugivore, on the other hand, has complete digestion in about 12 to 18 hours with a long intestinal sacculated colon. They can only metabolize small amounts of vitamin A and require no cholesterol whatsoever. They require fiber for peristalsis. They all have alkaline urine with weak hydrochloric acid. Fruitarians do not secrete uricose. Fruitarians have alkaline saliva and pitolin. Fruitarians have big salivatory glands. Fruitarians' upper jaws sit on the bottom and have great lateral and forward mobility. Fruitarians chew their food, not just crush it. Fruitarians have flattened big molars, big flattened incisors, blunt canines. Fruitarians see in full color and are fueled by glycogen and vitamin C is required. Fruitarian jaw angle is expanded with extensive chewing required and highly developed facial muscles to facilitate this chewing. Fruitarians consist of several types of species, like bats, the owl monkeys, humans, a number of flying foxes, and many passerine birds, toucans, and some species of parrots. Now consider this as well. Human cells have receptors for malic acid, citric acid, ascorbic acid, ascorbyl palmitate, and polyphenols. These are all elements found only in fruits and their requirements, yet nothing in the human body requires anything from an animal source. Think about it. If it was a baby, they would need meat to survive, yet this is not the case. That is actually disastrous for a child, as where we absolutely require vitamin C and absolutely require fiber and weak organic acids from fruit. Meat is a class 1 carcinogen worldwide. Meat cures no known disease of any kind, only causes it. Only plants can cure people. If you think about it, by all means, name a medicinal chicken or a cow. I'll wait. Another way to tell if a species is fruitarian is to map the area of absorptive mucosa in the gut versus functional body size. Even in 1971, a study done by B.J. Myers was published in the South African Medical Journal describing how lipid profiles and glucose tolerance improved on a particular fruitarian diet. In a further trial in the study, body weight and overweight subjects were showed a tendency to level off at the theoretical ideal weight. Humans are frugivores by design, but when we look at the ability to eat other food groups like an omnivore through the process of cooking skills, then it's possible. Without cooking, we are not able to survive as a raw omnivore. 
If you think you can, by all means, please go outside, pull some leaves off trees, catch an animal wild, raw, and eat them up, pull some grass out of the ground that you're walking on, and feast. See some wild lake grooms growing? No problem. Pull those suckers off and eat them. You'll be dead in no time. You are not an omnivore. You are a frugivore. Just like God designed us to be. I have been one since 2002. And no, I do not supplement. Evolutionists actually believe in the same thing we Christians do in this regard, even if they don't know it or not. That early man was a frugivore. Because think about it, either man was placed in a garden created for the fruit of the trees like the Bible says, or man evolved. Well, if man evolved, what did he do before he invented fire? That's right, he ate it raw. Raw fruit. It's obvious, because you can't run around eating raw meat. It's proven to be extremely dangerous, and meat is a class 1 carcinogen no matter where in the world you live. Besides, look at the scientific studies what happens when something eats meat. Let's check that out. Yes, vegetarian IQ in adults and kids are both higher. Since the smartest people on earth have also been vegetarians, then it makes sense. Einstein, Tesla, Isaac Newton, Pythagoras, Plato, Da Vinci, Voltaire. So observation shows that plants are better for IQ. Even the most recent study on vegans show that average to 10 points higher in both male and female. When animal studies are conducted, even on primates, it's the fruit-eating studies that actually show the bigger brain growth, not meat. Now, how about genetically? It's often said that we humans share 50% of our DNA with bananas, 80% with dogs, and 99% with chimpanzees. Taken literally, those numbers make it sound like we could pluck one cell from a chimp and one from a human, pull out the tangled bundles of DNA known as chromosomes, unroll each one like a scroll, and read off two nearly identical strings of letters. But in reality, the human and chimp scrolls don't sync up so easily. Other large mutations revised huge sections of text, duplicating a chunk of human DNA here, erasing a chunk of chimp DNA there, while throughout the scrolls, tiny mutations swapped one letter for another. When researchers sat down to compare the chimp and human genomes, those single letter differences were easy to tally, but the big mismatch sections weren't. For example, if a genetic paragraph, thousands of letters long, appears twice in a human scroll, but only once in its chimp counterpart, should that second human copy count as thousands of changes, or just one? And what about identical paragraphs that appear in both genomes, but in different places, or in reverse order, or broken up into pieces? Rather than monkey around with these difficult questions, the researchers simply excluded all the large mismatch sections a whopping 1.3 billion letters in all, and performed a letter-by-letter -letter comparison on the remaining 2.4 billion, which turned out to be 98.77% identical. So, yes, we share 99% of our DNA with chimps, if we ignore 18% of their genome and 25% of ours. And there's another problem. Just as a small tweak in a sentence can alter its meaning entirely, or not at all, a few mutations in DNA sometimes produce big changes in a creature's looks or behavior, whereas other times, lots of mutations make very little difference. So just counting up the number of genetic changes doesn't really tell us that much about how similar or different two creatures are. Even as far back as 2005, a peer-reviewed study found that we matched primates as low as 86%. Evolutionists have said that if we do not match great apes more than other mammals, then the case for common ancestry is debunked and falsified. Guess what? When testing the protein coding regions of other species, we have found that dogs, cats, pigs, and other species have more relation than primates do. So not only have we falsified evolution through fast-ticking mitochondrial clocks, debunking junk DNA, there's no such thing as beneficial mutations, human language formation cannot arise on its own, but now genetic relation. It has been falsified. Evolution is through. And then we can I'm give another alive. article for an entire phyla of animals that went extinct before the Cambrian. This has already been addressed by Standing for Truth multiple times, so just watch this. You're going to look to the fossil record, and even though it's just circumstantial evidence requiring an actual theory to account for the large-scale evolution, but 
all we see is a net loss of information and the fact that natural selection is severely constrained by selection interference. I mean, how are you going to, can you give me a few beneficial mutations that are not um, somewhat deleterious? I mean, how are you going to build? Because if, if you're looking to, a, you know, the, the lower levels of the simple organisms, um, and I wouldn't say a trilobite is simple by any means. It's certainly complex. Look at the eye. But how are you going to account for that information buildup? Where's the novelty? Well, that doesn't actually matter. We can start with evolution starts with a pre-assembled DNA and cellular mechanism. So we start with genes. So, so we can just lose information. That's fine. It doesn't matter. Well, no, no, because if these beneficial mutations that, that you agree are rare and they can seldom make the type of compensation that's needed to stop the net loss of information, you're not going to, it's like taking two steps forward, but then taking 10 steps backward. You're never going to climb that mountain and you're never going to get your fish to fishermen. It's a, it's a pseudo scientific belief, but you can believe it in it all you want, Taylor, but I haven't seen any evidence being presented the entire time. You're looking to the fossil record, but bones found in the dirt are not inherited. Traits are. Where's your evidence um, yeah. genetic? speaking I mean, what do you look to brother you're welcome to check their math but i just read off to you like four or five studies where they conclude the exact opposite of what you're saying well the thing is you look to uh well for one i'll, I'll go to you know those studies and mechanisms but where's your example of, of a beneficial mute because i agree that there are mutations that are beneficial given you know and they're environmentally um dependent of course i mean even looking at um, you know sickle cell anemia for example it's still ultimately reductive but at the end of the day there is some type of, of benefit to be had from it but where's your novel gain in information there taylor go ahead uh, well it's context dependent not all mutations are going to cause disease in every individual so you still don't understand how gaining an antifreeze function to your blood is a beneficial mutation well the thing is i'm not a, i'm not disagreeing with adaptations and the thing is it's funny that the only example you can go to is that, these notothenioid antifreeze arctic fish the antifreeze protein because all it is is a story they're looking at it it's already occurred and they're making judgments and inferences where's your real time and the thing is you know it's probably an epigenetic non-random genetic change anyways these fish go into the cold water and all of a sudden they have these antifreeze proteins that they develop based on pre-existing genetic adaptation but where's your actual you know observable evidence not looking at some story because i know evolutionists like to imagine and, and storytell but you're you're talking about a trade-off here you're talking about that it's context dependent but while the genome is degenerating in all many possible ways taylor and while a few nucleotide sites may be improving you know based on this context dependent beneficial mutations huge numbers are being degraded so this type of trade-off you're talking about it's obviously not sustainable as it's still going to result in a shrinking functional genome size so once again you can believe in it all you want and i put a capital b on believe but it's just a science fiction based religion with no actual empirical evidence I mean, you still haven't presented us any evidence you look to some bones found in the dirt i've given you a testable falsifiable prediction based on our model of catastrophic Nephi says operate. he wants to have a debate with me, but what he really wants to do is just in a, get in a video hangout where he can, I don't know, yell over me or something. Yell over you? What? That is basically what you did to me on every single comment or question. Look. He even argues that our, our knowledge oh. of molecular processes wait, 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 is not good enough to ever determine or question. rule out independent origins. So I it's telling us that, that a, that hello? things apply. Hello? density of hair that they have to protecting them from all elements they don't wait, get sunburned wait, wait, wait. hold on, sunburn hold on. let me know excuse what you me think. now lost their bees and now except they know how they're to not donate by hand except that they, they are not ability. well this thing can't do that thing then no, that's no, unfalsifiable no, no, and not science no, Matt, 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 well, well, hold on. Uh, something is a mammal but if you want to buy they, play they by have the exactly taxonomic the same rules, same that is very very though. strong they have twice as much density yeah they do have very very strong muscles information we're talking about it would have to be no, some no, no. kind of a what would, of then we get have to get in uh pretty recently um okay never uh, mind these these, these questions when humans are just no, it's not they have outdoor allergies they never fail and they have they, far yeah, better they hearing they have far better yeah, they color do. visions they do they have, have those everything, things things all the time this is genetic breakdown this is degradation genomic too. can you explain we're not, we're not powerful jaw look at their immunity they're immune to yeah they're all identical other species as well but when these genes mutate but because that, that, that same, if evolution was true they wouldn't have function because they well, evolved no, they are human beings so I, far I, long ago they, they, but, you can get no no evolution 
at a certain stage. Yeah, That's yeah, all. We believe in macroevolution. It just his, finishes his, his when book. you know well, things. No, 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 no. Hang on. The, they, they're they're just saying even when they know it's wrong. Even they what? say they don't know, and there's too much noise at the end of these branches. Zero percent of what? Clear definition of what a species is. Now you can't blather. Okay, so stop. His videos constantly. I know. Kent Hovind lies again. The longer they spend their time what, in the what, ocean, the less they need to shell. Turtle. Well, the turtle. It's still a turtle. Yeah, we, the how Odonte many species of turtle? Do you have any idea how many species? Not there. And to find results. Whoa, 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 whoa. Thing like that. I, I think they're understanding I mean, a macroevolution is a new morphological straw feature. Straw man. It's a straw man distortion of. By 99.9 percent. .9%. What are the odds? What are the odds that, odds? Uh, that human okay, beings have? No, we're not going to do this. Even argues that our our knowledge of molecular processes is not good enough to ever determine or rule out independent origins. So it's telling us that hello things apply. How about each other? Will they interrupt each other when they talk? Let's see. And they are the, what he would say colloquial, the, the groupage, and they could be monophyletic or para. Oh wow! Look at that, respectful, amazing. Watch some more, shall we? All right, Aaron. Um, well, what, once again, you... no, no. I just it, I always have a good time. It's really it, it, the explanation is boring. Shannon would be really good to do it with something with that along those lines. Maybe um, ten, ten if you're old like me. Be awesome. Uh, and then, of course, and and guys, after sure. that, weekend after that, I'll be back. And so, will you admit? Matt, listen very carefully. That would be pre Cambrian. Okay, uh, and I have. I'm gonna send this to. I'm gonna send this and to those David. Are, um, those are unknown, so that we can see this on the screen. And um, monkey uh, drunk. I, I feel like this. Is gonna, I feel like this is gonna replace the Sphinx guy. That thing. Can, Go ahead. I'm uh, sorry. Can you, uh, can you can you answer that about the bat? Um... Apply to the same clade. Yes. The colloquial so, word so, ape conforms so, to so when we're, the taxonomic superfamily Hominoidea, which means ape. And we're Hominoidea. <laughs> Back in a SpongeBob La La Land. See for yourself how many fallacies and appeals that R and Raw uses in just a four-minute clip with another atheist. So you want to withhold judgment wherever possible. What's your opinion of atheists that 100% believe that there is no God? Me. Like, are absolutely convinced that that's not the case. Did, 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 yeah. Is that you? Uh, yeah. Oh, wonderful! Can I can I talk to you about that? <laughs> absolutely. So yes. you you think that there's it? You think that certifiably 100% that there is no God whatsoever? That's correct. Uh, not just the Christian God, but any God, period. Right. Um, how did you determine that? It's answer? impossible by definition. Oh, what's the definition? I would... In order for, for some, remember I said that we have different rules, you know, that we're, uh, we won't say that something is proven like the believers will. You know, if they, say, if they find anything that, that would still be true in either case, they'll say it's absolute proof of their position. Mm -hmm. But we can't do that because that's dishonest. We actually have to have evidence that indicates that and wouldn't be true if the other case were correct. So we have something objective to verify, right? So we can't say that something is possible until we have a precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that such a possibility exists. We can't even say it's possible until then. And so we don't have a possibility true, of God. True, we can't say that it's possible, but eventually we could determine that if it was possible or not possible. Like, if it, if we don't we have, have the method available to us right now to determine if a supernatural God exists because we have no supernatural scientific methods. But in the event that we do and we're able to ascertain that, in fact, no God exists in the supernatural realm, then we would have a better argument to say that there's no God, wouldn't you? What do you think? Well, there's a handful of words that you kind of need to clarify. Okay. Uh, knowledge and truth and when we're talking about possible. There are things that are possible that we don't yet know are possible, mm -hmm. right? But we can't say they're possible. Until we because it would be dishonest. We can't be justified in saying that they're possible. The truth is what the facts are. They can tell you that they have the absolute truth, but if they can't show you the truth of it, then they don't have the truth. Is that justify saying that there's no possibility? Like you're saying it's impossible for a God to exist right now? It's impossible by definition. Uh, I've, I've only given you the first part of If we change the definition, would it then be possible? If we change possible to mean impossible, yeah, if, you, if we reverse everything. If we define so, what we meant by a god by like, oh, it's actually Greg, he goes across the street, he has lightning powers, he's from Asgard, who knew, right? <laughs> <laughs> what it, People do that, they did the god is love thing, mm -hmm. right? 
And so they want to come out that, that, that God is the force that creates us all. Well, that's, again, you've made it so ambiguous that everything is God and thus nothing is God. So if you're going to be talking about what is a God, then you've got to conclude that your definition has to include all of the gods, the, the hundreds of gods that were worshipped by thousands of people for thousands of years, mm. or millions of people for thousands of years. So if it doesn't apply to to, to Odin sure. or you know or to, to, to Hera, then it, it that definition doesn't work. So for me, I've concluded that a god is a magical, anthropomorphic immortal. Okay. okay. Magical meaning miraculous, mm -hmm. which again is impossible by definition. If miracle and miracle and magic have the same definition. They're the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural events in ways which are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics, which so. makes them physically impossible by definition. Okay. Yeah. Likewise, Magical. it is impossible for God to exist in as a disembodied mind absent the brain that created it, because a mind, by definition, is the data that is produced by a brain. Mm. So it's definitively impossible. <sighs> so the truth is what the facts are, and there are things that are true that we don't know are true, but we can't call it the truth until we can show that it is true. How would you falsify that observation? What, what? Your position on there's no God based on this definition, how is that falsifiable? How is... How is the falsification You said it's impossible because of these three, the three, the magical anthropomorphic and disembodied mind and stuff like that, I guess. If you want to, if you want to falsify the definition? Uh, no, I want to, I want you to, I want to see if, is there anything that you would recognize where you'd be like, oh, okay, well then disembodied minds can't exist. Or like, oh, okay, well then magic. Well, you'd have to change the definition of, of what a mind is. Mm. So it, we just have to switch all the words around. So the truth is whatever you want to believe. And, and fact is whatever you want to believe. You know, like I said, the truth is what the facts are, you, and it has to be objectively verifiable. If believers will call about facts all the time, but if it's not objectively verifiable, and, and you, can't, you can't call it a fact. Likewise, they say they have evidence. What is their evidence? Their evidence, I have this book. I get you. I get you. Why do they keep asking me if I will consider the other evidence? I was raised a secular evolutionist atheist myself. What the hell? Of course I know the other side of the argument. I became a creationist recently because of the evidence. Stay tuned for part two. A lot of comments were addressed to standing for truth before I came live onto the show. Lots to go over, lots to debunk. Let's do it. See you soon.